Hello, my name is Marilyn Norman and I'm a Master Gardener. This is a Master Gardening Moment. Today we're going to be talking about the installation of a low-growing native plant garden for a front yard. We're going to be covering a variety of, of topics related to site preparation, some individual plant selection, and then maintenance of this garden. Our choice today in uh, preparing this site in terms of site preparation was to take the sod that was already here alongside this driveway and to turn that sod over and just place double shredded mulch about two to three inches over the entire section. We had originally planned this um, on a grid so that um, we knew exactly what the dimensions were going to be and then we placed our plant, little cutouts of each of the plants that we had chosen to be on there. So we've done a little bit of planning before we did the sod removal and the application of double mulch. In doing that, we also made sure that um, the site was appropriate for the kinds of plants we were going to do. This is a clay high clay content soil so all of these prairie plants were excellent for that they don't need any soil amendment prairie plants usually don't need that um, it receives full sun it's on the east side of the home and receives at least six hours of sun during the day and we added mulch a little bit for um, reduction uh, and, and weed suppression this was done in March the spring of the year so that it would have adequate time um, to be ready for planting of plugs in late May, which is after the last frost here in um, Dubuque, Iowa. The suitable plants that we chose um, are all fairly low growing. Um, oftentimes in a front yard we want to make sure that we have low growing plants and a little bit more tidy so they don't fall over. We can always trim them um, if we're not happy with that, but low growing plants and plants that would be attractive and provide texture not only through the summer months but also throughout the year. We also chose at least 70% native plants in this so that um, we kind of follow um, a good guideline that's been established to make sure that um, if we do choose annuals for color, such as the ones that we've chosen here, um, that, we, that we keep that ratio of at least about 70% native plants. So let's look at some of the individual plants that we have here and um, the contribution that they bring, not only to this garden, but to the, um, to the beautiful array of native plants. As we work down our way, this plot is about an uneven eight foot wide at its widest point and about 12 feet long. Um, but you can make that to whatever your choice would be. We allowed a little bit wider border on the, on the driveway side to make sure that um, there was adequate drainage and that no plants would be unruly and um, flop down on top of the driveway. So here at the end, um, again, receiving full sun, we have some nodding onions. And nodding onions, we've kind of planted many of our plants in groupings, is um, a July-August blooming time. They have a white, um, white to pinkish little bloom on them. They're only one to two feet high, and we space those at about a half a foot to a foot apart. As we move down through the garden, we have a very pretty little grouping of purple prairie clover. Purple prairie clover is a, um, a June, July, August um, purple yellow plant. Nice um, fringy little green foliage. And again, it only grows to about one to two foot and the spacing would be about one foot apart. I added um, a palm sedge here because I love the color. Um, it's nice and, and, uh, and pretty and it will grow and expand slowly along the far edge of the garden. In the back here I have a um, little blue stem. Little blue stem is a grass and I like to put a percentage, a high percentage of um, grasses to provide a little more structure in gardens. And it sends up these beautiful tall spikes um, in um, August, well, August through October. And those spikes, although they're not 
huge, do get to be two to three feet high. They're very airy, and they have very small little seed heads on them. My um, annuals that I've planted in here, just for a pop of color, zinnias and um, agastache, those I will take out this fall, and I will probably plant some native spring flowers right in this area. Along the back side here, I have um, blue stem goldenrod. And blue stem goldenrod is, an, again, in August, September. It has really pretty yellow flowers, good for the migrating monarchs as they come through in September in this latitude. They are about two to three feet tall, and they are planted on about a one foot distance. In the back, um, this is a really nice example of almost a mature um, little blue stem. All of these plants are only a year old, so they are very healthy for this time of year. Ohio spiderwort, we've placed here in the back um, on the very far south side. That has um, blue blooms in June and July. And it gets to be two to four feet. I can pull that down. I can trim those down if I want. And they do tend to be a little bit yellow after they've bloomed. Annuals that I will take out, I'll probably put in a blue mist flower um, so I don't have to have that annual maintenance every year. Again, some palm sedge back here, uh, planting of two or three, really makes an attractive color difference and texture difference. I planted some um, Virginia Mountain Mint in here in the spring, thinking it would be a nice little color pop and add some new texture. I might remove that next year because if the stems stay upright, it can be fairly tall and also fairly aggressive in terms of, of how it likes to move around in the garden and take up more space than I really wanted it to have. Another nice little blue stem, um, um, almost looking mature, but with some beautiful little seed stalks. Of course, I have to have milkweed for the monarchs. <clears throat> milkweed is a staple for them. It's a host plant not only for the larva, but also produces beautiful flowers. And these are um, milkweed that are designed for clay. Um, they are a native uh, for our area. Back here in the back, we have beard tongue. It's a pestamon. And it's working on its roots, as are all of these plants in their first year. We talk about native plants going through a growing process of sleeping, creeping, and leaping. So in their first year, they're working on their root development. They're working on trying to make sure that just enough foliage is there uh, for them um, to make sure that they have adequate root and growth. Next spring, this garden is going to be much fuller and by the third year, this will be a mass of, of beautiful foliage and color. Some more little blue stems right here on the edge as a nice little border along this uh, south side. Um, more blue stem. Another pestamon back here. This was, is a smooth pestamon, and it is usually in bloom in the early part of the summer, like a June or a July, and it has white flowers. And it gets to be, again, two to three feet tall, and I'll probably add some more there because I'd like to have that a little closer spacing. We found that um, the closer spacing, um, the minimum spacing that we use that's recommended, allows those plant stems to grow straighter and not flop over as easily. Also in their first year, down here, are alum root, and alum root um, is a very beautiful little foliage plant. And there's a grouping of three here that sends up gorgeous little stems with flowers on the end. Okay, we've moved a little bit closer to the end. I've always allowed a little bit of space between the garden and the street so we can get a lawnmower through and around. We've added a garden feature here um, with a little bit of moving water for birds. Um, we have a place for them to land as, as well as um, making sure that that water is cleaned um, and, and fresh water is added every day. As we reach the very end of our garden, we have um, an orange coneflower that was nibbled on early, but it has recovered well, um, and it provides some very nice um, color so it can be seen from the street, as well as a close uh, grouping so that they will be a mass of flowers in late 
well, in August and in September. Another good nectar source. You can see that we've repeated the blue stem as the end of this border. It would be a nice, um, again, a nice attractive end to uh, look uh, from the street. We've repeated our purple prairie clover. We've repeated our nodding pink onion. So here's our garden. It provides um, a really nice change from the monoculture of grass. It has reduced our lawn um, by a, a, a pretty nice amount and it will provide excellent place for all the insects and the birds to enjoy throughout the winter for seed, for, for um, a place to hide and to grow. Just before we end, I'm gonna also encourage you to make sure that you label these plants. It's important for us to know what they are after they've been through a hard winter. And sometimes when they get to be growing, um, it's really difficult to figure out what you planted where. So each of these plants is labeled as I maintain the garden, um, because of the, of the mulch, I don't have a lot of weeds to pull. I can do that in about 10 or 15 minutes every day. So today we've talked a little bit about the installation of a low-growing native plant garden. We've covered a little bit about how this was prepared in terms of the site. We've talked about some suitable plants. Um, we've talked about their care and what you can expect from each of these plants. And I hope that you've um, learned a little bit about low-growing gardens that are made up of native plants. This has been a Master Gardener Moment. Thank you.